that community first village. Oh, good. How many of you have been to visit? Cool. Well, I too had the great opportunity to go there a week ago. And it is a village that was started by mobile loaves and fishes, which takes food trucks around the city and finds homeless people where they are and feeds them. And we realized with the great, great number that we needed to do, we as a community needed to do something about their housing. So they created, they've got 52 acres out off of Denver Lane on Hog Eye Road, you take Loyola South from 183, right on Decker and left on Hog Eye, and you're there pretty quickly. They have moved trailers on site. They have built many tiny homes. They are now up to a population of approximately 250 people there in the Community First Village. And it's a very interesting and highly functioning community which still has all the issues that anybody else does in living in community. But one of the things that they do, all right, what does, anybody know what that means? Must be a loose connection. Um, oh, that's, that's a rock garden. That, <laughs> and this is a few of the tiny homes and shows you the, the beauty of the area. But they also have a community garden which is organic. In the horse troughs are all herbs and you can see the extensive garden beyond that. A picture of yours truly. I wish he had gotten the collard greens that are off here to my right because they're up knee high, just flourishing beautifully. You can see they've got a greenhouse. The windmill in the background there is beyond the chicken coop and um, they've got a real little farm going there. They've got goats and chickens and they give away to the residents of the village organic eggs, organic produce. And I asked the gentleman who is um, dealing with that, how many people are, are taking advantage of that? And he said, probably only about half. But they do put out a flyer with a um, recipe every time they hold the farmer's market there which is pretty cool. This is the dye and fiber garden. And you can see the greenhouse in the background. Their extensive garden is between the dye and fiber garden and the greenhouse. And you can see, I think, where the peas are growing up tall there. So I just wanted to share with you, it's well worth a tour. Fun place to go see and, and very rewarding. Thanks. So I want to let you know what we're doing. And next up is Nick from Barton Springs Nursery. He's the super awesome propagator of no years who likes to do magic things with interesting and wondrous plants. <laughs> And he's here tonight to talk to us about drought-tolerant plants, um, ground covers, correct? Not all of them are drought-tolerant, but most of them are. All right, and we welcome Nick. Okay. I don't think I'm probably going to use the microphone. If y'all think I need to, let me know. Um, but it's... Uh, well, Mary asked me if I could bring some plants for sale, and I couldn't really. It was going to be too much of a hassle with sales tax and getting a square app on the phone and everything. 
uh, but I've brought a bunch of plans for show and tell, and some of them aren't that messy, and I might just pass them around. I did bring the primroses over here. Those are the pink blooming primroses that you see on the side of the highways. Uh, they are edible. I put them in my salads, both the leaves and the flowers. Um, and they are also used herbally uh, for a lot of women's issues, for regulating uh, menstrual cycles and uh, whatnot. But if you look up the, the herbal properties of that, it can be used uh, medicinally. Um, and I did bring, if anybody's familiar with pink knotweed, a magic carpet. Um, this is also up for grabs. It's a nice ground cover. Um, and there's rooted pieces on here, but you don't really need roots. Uh, you can just kind of bury some of the stems under the soil or some under some mulch and keep it wet for a little while and it'll make some roots. Uh, she, Mary said she likes to talk about the environmental issues uh, almost every time that she presents about global warming and whatnot. Uh, my presentation doesn't really touch on global warming exactly, but uh, it does touch on uh, all the reasons that you might want to plant ground covers for the environment, um, at any rate, for the environment in your little area. Um, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, one major reason is that uh, they're, they're part of the ecosystem. Um, you know, a lot of landscapes are going to be isolated specimens with mulch or gravel in between. That's maybe can be considered an ecosystem sometimes depending on how diverse it is. Uh, but if you have a garden that goes from the ground up, you've got ground covers, a variety of different ground covers, and you've got smaller herbaceous perennials, woody perennials, all the way up to your trees, you have several layers. You've created an ecosystem in your backyard. And, um, and ground covers are, are a big part of that. And a lot of people, I think, just go for the, the larger showier specimens and they forget that they can tuck these tiny little things in underneath those other things and that these two are part of that larger uh, <coughs> ecosystem. Um, one of the things that I really like about ground covers as a garden is that after you think you've filled your entire yard up and you're sad because now there's no room to plant anything, usually you can find room to tuck in yet another different ground cover. Um, and a lot of them are pretty versatile in terms of uh, you know, light requirements. Uh, so you know, you're gonna put it in the shade or you've got a sunny spot, a lot of them, you know, Got, I've got some succulents over here that are going to want more sun, and uh, a lot of things here want shade. But um, that's one of the things I like about ground covers is that there's, I can always find room in my garden to play with another different ground cover. Um, one of the major benefits of ground covers in the landscape is that they, uh, they conserve soil. They help prevent erosion. Um, they actually build soil, too, because um, they are trapping debris. Um, I mean, this is kind of like preventing erosion, but they're trapping that debris that otherwise would wash down the slope uh, in among their branches um, and holding it there. And they are also growing and dropping leaves and adding biomass to the system themselves. Uh, so they create soil, uh, but they also maintain the soil in place that is there. Um, some ground covers are going to be very, very good at, you know, if you've got a steeper slope, uh, they're, they're going to be the ones you want to plant. Uh, I like this wire vine, and it's got really interesting little flowers. I don't know, should I pass these around? They're some of them, not really. Um, yes. Y'all are welcome to come up and look at them. Um, they are kind of, some of them maybe a little messy. 
Uh, this one's got very interesting little flowers, not showy or anything, but if you get down and look at them, they're kind of cool. This is one of the better ones, I think, for planting on a, a steeper slope um, to maintain the soil. And it's going to root along its stems and spread that way. Now, not everything we call ground cover is actually going to root along its stems. Some things uh, are going to, you know, sucker up from, from down below. Uh, and they don't, you know, like the grasses. I have this, or the sedges. This is a blue-gray sedge, and obviously it doesn't have any stems to root along. You know, when these blades of sedge touch the ground, they're, they're not going to root. But it puffs out and makes little babies and spreads that way underneath the ground. Um, generally, when I say ground cover, I'm talking about something that's going to spread. It's going to cover the ground. It's not a discrete specimen that's going to stay there where I put it, it is going to crawl and move and cover the ground. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why, why they're good at uh, preventing erosion is that you, know, you plant them so far apart and then they're going to grow and they're going to meet each other and there's not going to be this bare dirt in between. Uh, speaking of bare, bare dirt in between your plants, uh, in addition to maintaining the soil in place that's there and building actually more soil, uh, the ground covers are going to suppress weeds because if you have something growing there, then that doesn't leave room for something else to grow there. Um, it's like the, the concept of cover crops when you're, you know, if you're farming or gardening, um, you know, in between your tomatoes, you might plant something low growing, um, you could plant mint or you could plant you know, clover. Uh, and a lot of those cover crops in the agricultural setting are planted like a clover to fix nitrogen in the soil. Some plants, like if you were to do mint, it's like, okay, well, it's a cover crop, but it's also I'm harvesting it. Uh, so you're getting more use out of the land instead of just having your tomato plants here and then here and then here and having mulch in between. Uh, and battling the weeds that come up in spite of the mulch, you've planted ground covers, and the ground covers actually act like a mulch and uh, keep the other weeds from growing because they're, they're taking up the space and the resources. Um, I, let me look at my notes. I did bring, I only brought 30 of these, unfortunately, but this is a list of uh, ground covers that were actually growing at Barton Springs Nursery. We do uh, order in a lot of plants from other growers. Uh, so those aren't on this list. Things like Asiatic Jasmine, uh, very, very common in the landscape trade. Uh, Mondo grass, these things we buy in from other growers uh, and we sell them. But this is a list of what we actually have on our own propagation. Uh, in, in our own propagation program. Um, and I brought things that I thought were a little off the beaten track. I'm, I just cast them this way. There's only, I think there's only 29. There's front and back, but there's only 29 of them. So unfortunately, I don't think there's enough for everybody. Uh, but take a look at them. Uh, and then, you know, if you come visit the nursery, you might know what you want to ask for. Um, Unfortunately, there was another column I've got on there, uh, whether it wants sun or shade, I've got on there flower color, if it does have a flower. Uh, I've got on there whether or not it takes foot traffic. Um, now, if it takes foot traffic, a lot of times it's also something that you can mow. Um, so that information is all on there. There was another column that, after I got them printed out, I realized that it didn't fit. Um, I could have left off the common names. Uh, and that column would have fit uh, that listed whether or not they were evergreen. Um, but uh, when we, I might make more copies and we'll have them available at the nursery. Um, but, oh, here's a few more. Is that what's on the Yeah. 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 Yeah.
similar. Oxalis? Yeah. No, it doesn't. Okay. Um, they, look they do look kind of similar, but it's, no, they don't. Uh, if oxalis fixes nitrogen in the soil like clover does, it does not. There are some non-bean family plants that do fix nitrogen in the soil. Interestingly enough, the uh, augustrum that everybody hates does fix nitrogen in the soil. Uh, question? Are any of these deer Um. You know, uh, the hypericum here is deer fruit. Um, they all have stickers on them, so they're all labeled, so you can see what they are. I, I can pass them around. I mean, I'm afraid the tables are all going to get money, though, is the thing. On your list, which one are nitrogen fixing? Uh, you know, I don't. Let's see. I don't think I have any nitrogen fixing plants that we are growing as ground covers. Uh, the, I mean, clover, you can get seeds for clover at, at Callahan's, um, and that's a great ground cover, uh, but it's not really something that is in demand in, you know, in a retail nursery center. People don't come and ask us for the clover. Uh, Greg, you have a question? Now, uh, do you have anything recommended to compete with uh, for me? Um, well, Probably something in the sun. Repeat the question. This profusion flea vein here um, grows very dense and roots along its stem. It has little white daisies. Um, that is something that I think would help to keep Bermuda grass down. What's the name of that one? This profusion flea vein. Uh, it's going to be on there under Erigeron, E R I G is the genus name. Um, the wire vine here also might help to keep Bermuda grass at bay. Um, those are the only two of the ones that I brought that I think really might might stand a chance at, at fighting back the, uh, the Bermuda grass. What's that? You grow frog fruit. We grow frog fruit. I didn't bring any. Um, mainly what I tried to bring is stuff that uh, is like but different other specimens that are more, more common, more well known. Uh, for instance, most of y'all are probably familiar with Purple Heart or some people call it Wandering Jew. Uh, I brought one called Jinx Farmer and this one has smaller internodal spaces. The leaves are a little fuzzier. Uh, I think it can take more sun. Um, it's just another different variety. Um, but will that one overwinter? It will. The Jinx Farmer will overwinter. It goes underground, but it will come back. You know, in a hard, hard winter, we might lose it. Um, I also brought, speaking of Travis Canchas, I brought this cobweb spider work, which is related to the uh, Purple Heart. Um, and this one really does want sun. And if you are familiar with, say, silver pony foot, and you love that kind of gray foliage for ground cover in the sun, uh, there's also woolly stemodia that we grow. I didn't bring any. Uh, there's, uh, I did bring some salvia chianophila. Uh, it's a little ground cover sage um, with kind of blue gray foliage. Uh, so there are these two plants I like to recommend for people who don't want to go with, oh, everybody's planting silver ponyfoot. I mean, it's one, of our, it's one of our biggest sellers at the nursery. People come in, they always want silver ponyfoot. I like to say, hey, well, you know, if you want the gray leaves for ground cover in the sun, try the cobweb spider wart. Try the, uh, you know, the snowflake sage. Um, try the woolly stemodia. Um, I like to try to point people in the direction of something that's not as in demand, that's not as common in the trade, um, and, and just you know to help people realize that there's lots of options. Just because, for instance, landscapers are planting Asiatic jasmine in all the business complexes, as that's that's the ground cover, Asiatic jasmine. I I 
I'm so tired of it that there's you know there's other options that, that you can do instead. Uh, I did bring this is uh, called blueberry leaf fig ivy, and it's related to the standard fig ivy. Uh, we grow four different types of fig ivy. Um, this I feel is the most sun hardy and probably really the most cold hardy of the fig ivies that we grow. Um, I know the standard fig ivy is can be pretty evergreen once it's established, but, uh, but I feel this one is, is even more cold hardy and certainly more sun hardy than, than standard fig ivy. And it's one that you can plant instead of Asiatic jasmine. Um, speaking of Asiatic jasmine, I did bring some Asiatic jasmine. <laughs> but this is, a, I'll pass this one around. Um, this one is, or just, anyway, it's, it's got narrow leaves. It's really kind of interesting. And it can be used more of a specimen uh, and a border. Uh, you don't have to necessarily use it to cover, you know, You've seen a 40 square foot area. Um, you can just kind of tuck it in here and there, and it's you got an interesting leaf, so it can be, be used kind of as a, a specimen. Um, let's see. Uh, and also, I think this wire vine is another good one that can be used instead of the Asiatic jasmine. Question for Are any of these native plants? Um, we have here, this is the native white blooming yarrow which I think can, um, you know, is very versatile, can grow in sun or in shade. Um, it can be used medicinally. Um, you can just munch on the leaves too. I do that sometimes. They call it carpenter's weed. If you cut yourself and you take some yarrow and chew it up and then put that wad of chewed up yarrow on your cut, it's going to help stop the bleeding. Um, but it's very pretty little fern-like leaves. Um, and, and like I say, very versatile in terms of sun and shade. Um, so that's a native. What color blue? White. But we do also sell at the nursery uh, some other different types of yarrow. We sell one called paprika, which blooms red. We sell one called uh, moonshine. I think it's called moonshine. It blooms yellow. Do you think those other ones can take shade as well? Uh, I, you know, I think the white's probably going to take the shade better than the other ones. And the, I think that the white and the paprika are going to spread equally as well. The paprika is, I think, also a millifolium, whereas the moonshine yarrow has different leaves um, and kind of grayer green leaves. And um, anyway, the moonshine yarrow, especially, I think, would want more sun than the other two. It can still go in part shade. Uh, and I don't think the moonshine yarrow is going to spread like the white or like the paprika would. Um, we also have for natives, uh, well the flea vein is, this profusion flea vein is not actually the native plains flea vein that grows here. Um, but it's close and uh, can be used similarly as the native plains flea vein. Uh, it just, it's the one in the nursery trade because it tends to grow faster and it's lusher, and, uh, but it's a lot like that native plains flea vein. Uh, this is kind of a mess, but this is a clover fern and y'all have this growing as a ground cover in your prehistoric garden. Um, and it's also a native. Um, and, and prehistoric. It's been a native here for a long time. What is that? Uh, it's clover fern. What is its uh, genus species? Marsalea is the genus and Macropoda. What so, kind of habitat? You know, it doesn't really need to be in a wet setting. This is probably the messiest of the bunch. They're not being muddy. Uh, uh, it doesn't really need to have wet feet. Mostly over here in the, in the uh, prehistoric garden, it is growing in lower lying areas, kind of by the riparian uh, strip. Uh, but it, it's fine if it dries out a little bit. It'll go 
it will disappear and then come back when you get some rain. Um, it, it will take more sun if, it's, if, if it gets more water, um, but I would ordinarily recommend it for part sun to shade. Um, definitely could take full sun if it was if its feet were wet. Um, and then uh, what else native? Uh, the Hacienda creeper is not the native Virginia creeper, but it behaves more or less like that. It was found growing in some haciendas, I guess, either probably South Texas. Um, it's smaller, more controllable than the Virginia creeper. Virginia creeper will grow, you know, up into a treetop, get 30 feet long. Uh, so it's a little more manageable than the native Virginia creeper. It also tends to hold its leaves longer into the cold season, and the leaves turn scarlet red and hold that scarlet color for, for quite a while. So this can be, I mean, it climbs, but it can also be used as a ground cover. I've seen that done uh, on some of the garden tours uh, that Lady Bird Johnson puts on. Uh, I've seen it used as a ground cover, and, uh, and I love it. It really just turns so scarlet red. It doesn't bloom or anything, but, but it puts on a good show in the fall, and it's a lasting show because, like I say, it holds onto its leaves longer than the, uh, than the Hacienda. Um, do you mean than the Virginia? I think uh, you say this is the Virginia, yes. This is the Hacienda. This is the Hacienda. Um, and for natives, that's really everything I have. I mean, I did bring the Wadelia uh, trilobata, which is related to the Wadelia texana, the, the hairy sex mania. Um, but this is not native. Uh, and doesn't really take the sun as well as the, uh, as the native Texas Wadelia. But it's a wonderful, wonderful ground cover for the shade, park shade. Uh, and it gives you, you know, it's nice big yellow daisy flowers in the shade, which is kind of hard to come by. Um, uh, this one is called Creeping Daisy. Um, would be on there under Wadelia trilobata. Um, let's see. I oh no oh I was going to mention while we were on the try to scan the subject I did bring this leopard wart um, which has these purple spots all over the green leaves that's another one that's in the same genus with the uh, purple heart and I'm kind of fond of it. Uh, one of the things I I tried to do coming in here today to bring stuff that you can't get at other garden centers. I mean, maybe you can every once in a while, but uh, a lot of this stuff we grow and we grow it in limited numbers and and you can't find it really anywhere else. Is that related to like day flower or? Um, yes. The, so, so the well, day flower and the um, uh, spider wort are edible. Is that one edible? You know, I've never gone to eat it, but uh, I wouldn't be afraid to eat it. I mean, I haven't tried it, but I, uh, I would. I haven't see, I looked it up, and I don't remember seeing that in, mentioned in the edible book. That purple. Well, the flowers on this are much smaller. Um, I don't know if you'll all know, but the day flower or the the, the spider wart, especially uh, the flowers are edible. The tender stems are edible on the spider wart. Um, the giant spider work in particular, I mean, there's enough flower there to really do something with. And Mary was asking about this one. The flowers on this one are kind of smaller, so, I mean, you can probably eat them, but there's not really a lot to work with here. Whereas on the giant spider work, you know, if you want to make tempura or something, those spider work flowers are perfect. Um, so let's see, I think we've covered, oh, um, I also wanted to bring in some things that were uh, not generally considered ground covers, but that they can be used as ground covers. Um, the Hypericum already went around, uh, and I don't think most people consider it to be a ground cover. It will root when these when the uh, tips touch the ground. It will root and move like a ground cover. I think the main reason that it's not considered a ground cover is that 
uh, it, it's taller in stature. It will get up to like two feet, maybe a big one even not pushing three feet. Uh, the medium leaf firecracker fern and this yellow blooming, the yellow one actually has some flowers on it. Uh, and y'all have the red one in the Japanese garden. I think you might have the yellow one too, but the red uh, narrow leaf firecracker fern for sure is in the Japanese garden. Uh, but they all move like ground covers in that they root, when their stems touch the ground, they root like that. Primrose jasmine does that too. I wouldn't really consider primrose jasmine a ground cover because it really does. I mean, it turns into a, a big rambling shrub. Uh, but these guys, uh, in the right setting, can be used, you know, if you're not trying to walk on your ground covers, if it's an area that you want just covered with ground cover or just covered, you know, but they're going to get about that tall, um, about two feet. The hypercum, is that St. John's wort? That's St. John's wort, we call it Aaron's beer. Oh, okay. Um, it, does it make those big yellow flowers? Big yellow flowers okay. in the shade. Okay. Yep. Um, Nick, I'm sorry, what was the one that you were just talking about? Was it the primrose that does this? The oh, the primrose jasmine? Yeah. That's, that's the yellow blooming large shrub that you see blooming right now all over town. One of the first spring bloomers. Uh, I don't really consider it a ground cover, but it does root, uh, you know, when its stems touch the ground, so. And will it grow in, in full sun? Yes. Yes. Uh, my, one of my neighbors in my, uh, has his primrose jasmine trimmed up to where they actually have trunks and you don't see any, uh, any foliage until about maybe four feet up off the ground. Uh, so that's really effective because the way the primrose jasmine grows, you know, it's this big fountain. But he's got it to where it comes up and you, he's braided the uh, stems actually. And then about yay high, he's let it go ahead and start to do its thing. So that's pretty cool. Did I, did I have a question back here? I was just wondering, do any of the ground covers, do you have to care if it's on a slope or something like that? Because I know that the ground covers do have to care if it's on a slope. If it's rather slope drain thing, does it matter if they get kind of washed away? A lot of these ground covers here I brought in, especially for planting on slopes um, to help prevent soil erosion. Um, some of them are not as well suited. Um, you know, for for steeper slopes, um, maybe the succulents, um, maybe the oh, this persicaria might not be the best one for erosion control. Um, this strawberry begonia might not be the best for erosion control. Um, but a lot of these I brought in especially because they form these dense mats and really hug the ground and um, are very, very appropriate for planting on slopes. And you know, if you've got a problem with erosion with the rest of your landscape there, you plant these ground covers in among your, your other things and they're gonna help those other things really hold that, hold that slope. Um, I have a question. Um, would that be an ideal thing for a, a pot, um, for a back, for a garden, garden type pot? No. Container garden. Container which, garden which, yeah. which plant in particular? Anything. That, oh. You know, uh, I mean, would you be yes. so yes. some of those who are high rise uh, folks around Well, here? you know, when it comes to container gardens, uh, people say you should include uh, in the mix a thriller, uh, a spiller and a filler, and uh, so I don't I know. Love have you all heard that before? Yes. Okay. Well, ground covers can either be considered your filler or your spiller in a lot of cases. Uh, sometimes, if it's a really cool ground cover, you might even consider it your thriller in the pot. But a lot of these can be used in container gardening. Um, you know, if you have something more upright uh, in the center of your pot and you want some other things around the pot, um, the firecracker ferns in particular have been used uh, in pots because uh, they can be quite showy. Um, 
I forget which restaurant it was downtown, uh, like an Asian fusion place on Second Street or something. But they had quite a few uh, pots. What was that? They have, yeah, and they're wonderful. Um, also for container gardening. Um, Firecracker ferns would be my favorite for container gardening. Um, oh, the succulents here. I, unfortunately, I didn't get the succulents on the list. I put that list together today and I realized that when I sorted my spreadsheet, I had the wrong codes on the succulents, so they didn't get sorted out of the entire planting list and put into the ground cover list. They stayed in the succulent list. So, uh, but I brought some succulents in because they can be used as ground cover. But they also, I think, would be very appropriate in some container garden. Uh, um, and the strawberry begonia, I think, would be very good in container gardens. Um, I want to touch on another thing um, as far as like for the environment. We've talked about uh, erosion control and uh, soil conservation um, and about weed suppression. Uh, but the ground covers also really help to create habitat um, as part of that bigger ecosystem. You know, instead of just having mulch in between mulch and gravel or uh, whatever in between your, your larger specimen plants, when you put the ground covers in there, it provides all this extra habitat for little organisms, uh, your insects and your uh, rodents, your lizards. Uh, it just creates that much more place for little creepy crawlies to crawl around in if it's, it's not just gravel or mulch. Uh, you've got all this going on instead. Uh, and then a lot of the ones I brought in today are specific to uh, certain uh, certain types of uh, animals, say. Uh, the firecracker ferns, uh, the red one in particular, is going to attract hummingbirds. Um, I didn't bring any Greg's Blue Mist flower. It's on the list there. That's a host plant for the bordered patch butterfly. Um, the... Uh, Woods Pink Aster is a wonderful nectar source for a lot of butterflies. Um, the Royal Road Violet, the uh, Snowflake Sage, the Lyre Leaf Sage, uh, this is one of my favorite herbs um, for ground cover, the Catmint. Those are all um, blue blooming flowers fragrant, a lot of them, but uh, also the tritoscanches, um, those are all going to uh, be good nectar sources for the bees. Um, so, so yeah, we, we've got bees and butterflies and hummingbirds that are all going to appreciate having some ground covers that are flowering in the mix with the rest of the landscape. Um, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I, I can keep talking or, yeah. Um, so, let's see. A question? Yeah. So what about the water? How much water are these plants need? Generally speaking, everything I brought, once it's established, is going to be fine in the landscape with the rest of your landscape with whatever water the rest of your landscape is getting. Um, but not really zero escaping. And it still needs some water. The xeriscape plants that I have here, I would say, would be the salvia chianophila, um, the, uh, the succulents over here, obviously, are going to be good, uh, good xeric plants. This bat's pink dianthus is bulletproof. It goes right through our coldest winters, no problem. Our hottest summers, no problem. Uh, you can mow it. I would set the uh, mower on high, you know, maybe four inches or so, but you can mow it. Uh, it's always just this beautiful silver blue color, uh, and then it makes little pink, pink dianthus flowers. Um, so that was going to be drought hardy. 
Uh, a lot of them, because they do go subterranean, uh, can be drought hardy. Even though they disappear in the drought, uh, they come back when you get some rain. I've got this, uh, unfortunately the flower has broken off of it, um, but this French leaf Coreopsis, uh, and that one I would consider drought hardy. It runs and suckers and um, you can get a whole little area that's got these yellow daisies coming up and more little baby plants coming up from the base of it. Uh, the lighter leaf sage I would consider drought hardy, even weedy, I would call that one weedy. Um, the, there's a little silver pony foot, I brought this specimen of white myoporum uh, because it Oops, accidentally had some silver pony foot growing in it. The silver pony foot would be drought hardy. Um, the myoporum may be kind of medium. Uh, you know, and then it depends on whether you're planting in the sun or in the shade. A lot of things uh, I would consider quite drought hardy if you've planted them in the shade. Uh, the wire vine and the uh, blueberry leaf fig ivy, this narrow leaf. Asiatic jasmine, uh, the dwarf horsetail. Um, this one would be a good one. I haven't seen it really in the Japanese gardens or in the prehistoric gardens, but this one would be appropriate in either one of those two places. Um, so yeah, that's from what I have here. Those are the ones that I would say are drought hard. Um, the other ones are all more or less normal. Uh, I would say that the strawberry begonia might be a little thirstier, the leopard wart, the persicaria. Um, what about the primrose? The prim I mean, the primrose grows wild on the side of the highways. Uh, it's that, you know, here shortly we're going to just see pink all over the side of the highways, and that's what it is. Is that is that primrose? Uh, so I mean, it's drought hardy in its season. Once it blooms, it gets kind of tall, ragged looking after it blooms, and then tends to disappear through the heat, and then come back in the cool season again. Sometimes from the root, uh, though oftentimes just from seed. Uh, so I mean, it's a native. It's drought hardy in its season. But I wouldn't expect it to look pretty in the summertime because it just that's not what it does. If you have like a blank slate and you wanted just to get some ideas of different combinations or color combinations or just you know a, kind of like a map of what you would suggest or a good idea for a layout, what resources would you have for that? For designing a garden bed? Just helping you design to get more of that intermixed with what you need. For intermixing ground covers, particularly? Um, I would, uh, I mean, I never studied landscape architecture, but I've been in the field for a long time, and I know you put the tall things in the back and, <laughs> um, and, and the short things up front. So uh, if you're designing a bed, um, you a lot of times your border, um, you know, if you've got taller things that are more showy, or taller, maybe your ground covers are showy too, but you've got your taller things a little farther away from where you're going to be, where your walkway is, say. So like none of those, any of those things would pretty much go with anything you want to pack, okay. you'd say? I would say... Um, go with your favorite ones first. <laughs> go with your favorite ones first. Uh, Sometimes, you know, if you're working with particular color combos, um, the sheet has listed what colors the blooms are on these. Uh, a lot of times, I, I know in landscapes, I'll see stuff like Mandina mixed with Lenheimer Muley, mixed with Blackfoot Daisy. And maybe you can just look at it and say, oh, that looks nice, but for me, I kind of keep those things separated, you know. If I want kind of more of a, uh, you know, a 1950s type of garden, like what I remember my grandma had, 
or you know if I want more of a like a Asian type feel uh, I might do Nandina and and I wouldn't include uh, you know, the native white yarrow in that landscape. I probably wouldn't include the Hasi and the Creeper. I probably wouldn't include the, I, I don't know, depending on the design, maybe some of the succulents I would say would be appropriate. I probably wouldn't include the snowflake sage. Uh, but just in terms of aesthetics, like what, you know, how designs have been done, uh, you know, if you're doing a native garden, you would stick with things that feel that way. Even if they're not native, they have a kind of, look that fits um you know i mean i don't think these firecracker ferns uh they're not native but uh i think in a native type garden i think they would be appropriate um so i would it's really a matter of personal taste uh, when it comes to design um except for that you want to make sure that everything's got its space that it needs um and with ground covers, fortunately, a lot of times you don't have to worry about that so much. If you plant them too close together, you're just not getting as much bang for your buck as you would if you planted them farther apart. Um, though sometimes you want to get your ground covers and you do want to plant them closer together maybe than even the guy at the garden center recommended because you're on a slope and you really want, you're in a hurry to uh, maintain, you know, to, to stop the erosion. So you plant your plants closer or you're really battling the weeds and so you plant your you plant your ground covers closer because you're in a hurry for them to fill in you can thin it later right so you can dig some up later and give it to your friends you know so. uh, what do you have to say under a giant red oak tree and there's turf you know hard, you have three inches of turf <laughs> um, do you ever recommend um, horse syrup Horse herb is wonderful. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that would be very. Is that good for shade? Yes. Okay. Yeah. How big did the miniature horse tail get? Um, fourteen. Yeah, maybe a foot tall. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Are, are they um do you think that it's not like regular horse tail? Um, I think that. Let's see, it's I don't. I think it's the horsetail that's used medicinally. It's that uh, um, ephedra. Oh, ephedra. There's yeah. a ephedra that grows around here, uh, native. You can find it if you're on a hike. Sometimes you'll find it uh, growing on cliff sides and stuff. Uh, I don't think the horsetail is used medicinally. I may be wrong, but I think it might be a ephedra that you're thinking. But uh, now I'm curious, so I'll have to look that up later. <coughs> Fedra, you can't buy because it's regulated. Right, you can't, like, I haven't seen a Fedra for sale in the nursery ever. Occasionally we'll have a grower come in and, and have some just for staff, uh, but we haven't ever sold a Fedra to the public. Um, but it grows here, native. Um, you, you can find it on hikes sometimes growing up on the, on the cliff sides. They have an example of it over at the uh, American Botanical Center, or Austin Botanical Center, ABC. Out okay. On, uh, Maynard Road, I think. Yeah, gosh, they have a big plant of it. Over there. I yeah. Go <clears throat> yes. What about a juga? Uh, juga is a great ground cover for the shade. Um, you've got some of that buca weed over there. I know we were talking about it earlier, uh, and it spreads readily. Um, and in the shade, it can, I would consider it drop hardy, um, you know, in a normal year, I would say so. Even weed, it can be weedy. <coughs> so none of the ones you thought are considered weedy or invasive? Uh, I would consider, um, I mean, depending on your water, but like this creeping buttercup, um, if it's getting enough water, it's going to crawl all over everything. Um, but it never gets any taller than about like that. So, you know, if you're not trying to grow other things in with it of smaller stature, having it crawl all over everything is a cool thing because it's keeping the other weeds from coming in. And it's, I mean, the leaves are pretty, the flowers are pretty, uh, but it's only going to be that aggressive uh, if, if it's getting 
plenty of water. In a normal water situation, it's going to tend to stay more in its own place. Um, other weedy things here, I mean, the flea bane maybe could, it, it starts to seed out. Um, so the flea bane could cons be considered weedy in some cases. Uh, and the liar leaf sage definitely is going to seed out everywhere. Um, so that one could be considered weedy. Um, you know, maybe maybe the uh, leopard wart, because the leopard wart is going to seed out a bit too. That could maybe in some cases, again, if it's getting plenty of water, like this creeping buttercup, uh, it'll be more weedy if, it, if it's getting too much water. It's going to love it and go crazy. Yes. What about Ruelia? Uh, Ruelia can definitely be weedy. Uh, the tall one in particular. Um, the blue shade Ruelia doesn't seem to be as weedy as, say, the Katie Dwarf Ruelias. Certainly not as weedy as the Chi Chi Pink or just the tall, uh, what they call Mexican Petunia. Um, but yeah, Ruelia can be pretty weedy. Now the dwarf ones, obviously they're not getting, I mean I've seen the Mexican Petunia get as tall as me almost, mm -hmm. and then it gets heavy and then it falls over and then it roots on its stems, plus it's got flowers everywhere and the seeds are going everywhere, uh, whereas the little dwarf one, you know, it only gets that tall, so it, you know, it, it's not going to get tall and flop, and those seeds are only going to go this far instead of, you know, six feet diameter. Yeah. Ruelia shoots its seeds. Do you know that? If you're watering yeah. it, you just, it bombards you with like pellets. Yeah. It actually, <laughs> it's a tremendous amount of pellets. Yeah. 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 We, used, we used to get the seed pods when we were little and shoot them at each other. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so your neighbors may not appreciate it. <laughs> uh, the Ruelia? Yeah. Uh, Depends. Depends on your neighbors. <laughs> I mean, for me, uh, I don't like to do a lot of work in my yard. I mean, I, I love it, but I, I don't want to try to grow things that are difficult, generally. I want to grow things that are easy, things that are weedy. I'm like, yeah, be a weed in my yard. I actually love weeds uh, because you plant it and you're done. Like, now all you got to do is just pull it out from places where you don't want it. But you don't have to worry about, like, is it okay? It's fine, you know, it's, it's doing its thing. Uh, and then the other thing about weedy species in the garden, uh, it really depends on what else is in the garden. Uh, and again, on how much water it's getting. Um, if, if it's staying drier, it's not gonna be as weedy. Uh, if it's in competition with other vigorous weedy species, it's not going to, uh, you know, two, two weeds are going head to head, so you've got kind of a balance, and, and it's working. Um, whereas if you have a weedy species growing next to one of those harder to grow species that's not so vigorous and doesn't spread, then yeah, your weed is going to eat that other one. But if you have two, you know, if you have, if you pick a bunch of plants that are all easy to grow, strong, vigorous weeds, or they could be weedy, and you mix them in together, then they're going to find a balance, and they're not going to, um, you know, nobody's going to take care, uh, take over anybody else that way. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have some areas with real shifting sun. The, our house, <coughs> um, the sun drops behind our house during this time of year. Um, so are there things that are good for you know, intense sun in the summer, <laughs> but a lot of shade during the yeah, same time? Um, definitely. Um, so you're saying shade in, in, in the wintertime mm -hmm. and the sun in the summertime, which is kind of opposite of what you would maybe hope for. Uh, but, <laughs> but there are some things that would be fine in that situation. Um, Oh, of what I got here, uh, oh, I think the, the myoporin would maybe work, uh, the woods pink aster would work, 
um, the Lyre Leaf Sage, um, probably the Yarrow. Now, if you're in intense sun in the summertime, these things are going to need more water. So that's, we can get it, you know, we can pick something that's going to be okay in the shade in the wintertime and okay in the sun in the summertime if it's getting water in the summertime. Um, but a lot of stuff, this is Texas, so even if it's billed as a full sun plant, um, a lot of stuff, I mean, even in the wintertime, uh, can take more shade than it's generally given credit for and, and appreciate it, in fact. In, in that situation, you know, you got a really hot, intense sun on there. Sweet potato vines. Yeah. Sweet potato vines are so going to look really pretty. You could do, you know, now we have all these different colored vines that are out there also. So doing strips every three feet and then switch it over to a purple vine and then another one. And, you know, that yeah. might be appropriate. Plus, you get something to eat out of it. Um, well, the sweet potato vines will do fine in, in a lot of shade, um, and with good water they'll do fine in full sun. Uh, in the winter time, they're going to freeze back, you're not going to see anything, but they really develop those big tubers under the ground, and uh, so they're going to be cold hardy. And they'll